Uh, I know you don't want to maybe sing a lot of names, but uh, I recall Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma being particularly tough on State Department witnesses uh, on the Hill, uh, sort of accusing them of not living in the real world in terms of the need to offer cuts rather than uh, budget hikes. And I was just wondering if, uh, if you have any response to the idea that the, the staffers and the uh, professional diplomats uh, are not totally uh, adjusted to the uh, budget climate. Yeah, I, I, I you know, listen, I talk, I'm not taught, discuss individual centers, uh, the good days or the bad ones. Um, but I will say this, um, we get, and it's not a diplomat anywhere in the world who doesn't understand we're going through very substantial economic hard times here in the U.S. And to be clear, Many diplomats are going through economic hard times. There's plenty of plenty of us in this room who have family members who are looking for a job or are what they call underemployed. You know, plenty of us have 401ks that are you know worth you know half of what we thought. And I guarantee many of us in this room and many of people have houses that they kept here or are worth nowhere near uh, the mortgage they have on them. Okay, so we we don't live in some sort of fantasy world, and and so I so we get. It. Uh, and we get it in spades. Um, and, and I think, quite frankly, I, I would argue, and I would argue very clearly, that we have the best return on investment than any agency in this government does. So $50 billion for 1% of the federal budget, we not only provide um, embassies and consulates all over the world, you know, 250 different locations where we have people on the ground. It pays for all of our assistance that we do all over the world, including $3 billion uh, for the state of Israel, as well as our support for the Egyptians. It's supporting all of what we're doing in the Arab Spring. It is, the, it is the money that we spent on fighting the frontline states, which we have concluded are enormously important to our national security. It's what we do to basically support PEPFAR, which is a Republican initiation of, a, of a, a terrific program to eradicate uh, the AIDS virus around the world. I mean, tell me where um, money is better spent. Listen, can we always do more with less? Sure, we don't have a choice. We've been cutting. I, we cut all the time. We make decisions all the time. We slow hiring when we can't afford it. We, we, um, we cut back on missions where we don't believe it is. I mean, Pat Kennedy constantly is trimming left and right. Poor Barbara's every day trying to figure out <laughs> Where we, you know, I was in Seoul um, last week, and the, and the, you know, the the embassy is in terrible shape, terrible shape. I mean, it's just not. We need to, we need to, we need to renovate the embassy. But we have decided because of priorities, it's in the queue, but it's down the queue line with, with things that are also need to get done um, before that for other national security reasons. So we we're living in a very uh, realistic world, and and I will uh, defend. To, to my last breath, the fact of our, our ability to understand uh, that we're living in tough economic times. And with that, I will defend any time, uh, at any place, uh, the return on our investment. And I think uh, most, um, um, most members understand that um, uh, quite well. Thank you so much. You think I was passionate? Uh, <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Tommy Grant, and Susan is our senior advisor for the Civil Service Association, which just formed. You may have seen the department notice back in January. I like your style. You say, what can we do? I want you to tell us what we can do. We can write about the conditions on Facebook. We could make uh, some statements uh, in other media. But what do you want us, your civil servants, and when I say civil servants, as, as Susan always says, civil servants mean foreign service and civil service. What do you want us to do? Give us maybe two things that we won't get in trouble because we love our jobs and want to stay here. <laughs> what can we do to support you and the secretary? Because national security is it. I worked at the passport office for, I guess, 30 years. And we're not talking about a party document. We're talking about border security. Yeah. Finally, I think Congress gets it. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Well, that's, that's really nice. I appreciate it. And Liz, first, first, what you're already doing, which is, you know, working here. Um, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know, many of you 
have committed your careers to working in government service or working for the foreign service or civil service, and the fact of the matter by doing that on well, we that's a benefit to us. I think, as you know, um, you know, the, the rule, I don't know what the rules are vis a vis um, communicating to the Hill as it relates to this uh, group of people, but um, the reality of this is, is that um, we have to tell our stories, okay? We have to make our stories real. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, with, with George, listen, I'm a big Democrat, so I don't, I don't, so I can say this. What George Bush did uh, on uh, on PEPFAR was beyond remarkable. Okay, so what he did is he basically articulated the fact that 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 fighting uh, AIDS and the and the virus overseas had huge national security impact for us, and he was able to make it real for a lot of Republicans and. And, and church groups and NGOs and I mean, people who never ever supported anything that we talked about assistance. And they rallied around because the president and then Condi Rice and then obviously Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama but made it real. Okay? It is the one part of the budget that doesn't get cut. Okay? I mean, it's really been, they built the constituency, but they made it real. Um, the issues around um, uh, counselor, counselor services, it's unbelievable. That is, you talk to members of Congress, you know, I was in Florida two weeks ago, and I was in Ross Layton's district, you know, she's the chairwoman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, she sometimes gives us a little bit of a hard time, um, but she loves our consular affairs operations in, in Miami. Okay? I went to visit the operations right in her district that she's visited numerous times, because guess what? It's not only about national security, it's about constituency service, we're making it real for her about how important this is, okay? And we've got an enormous amount of uh, support for that. <coughs> you know, we talk about everything. The, the Arab Spring, we, it's a kind of like, you talk about the Arab Spring, when in fact, look what's happened in the last year. Look what's happened last year. You know, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, I mean, look what's going on in Syria. I think the reality is people recognize that the State Department is in the middle of the biggest transition in the Middle East has seen in 100 years. So I think that the trick for us, for our constituency, and listen, I, I, I understand we're never going to change the American public's view of what the State Department is. And I don't, that's, I mean, I'd like to, I want them to feel good about it and they believe that we do the right thing. But this is, a, this is amorphous to most people in their daily lives, okay? Most people's association with the State Department does not associate with the passport office, I assure you, okay? But that's the connection for 99% of the American people's connection with the State Department is the fact that they have to go get their passport renewal, okay? But for that 1%, and that 1% are really important. There are opinion makers, there are constituents, there are the constituents on Capitol Hill. They need to hear, again, how real this is for all of us. So my, I guess my answer to your very simple question is, it is up to us to make sure that we talk about this in very real, um, real terms. We have a question here, and there's somebody here. Okay. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, thank you for your time, Mr. Deputy Secretary. I'm Keith Curtis with the Foreign Commercial Service, and I, I really listened very intently when you <laughs> talked about the economic statecraft. Uh, I know as a businessman, you appreciate how important that job argument is on the Hill, um, and uh, I also appreciate how you love your colleagues in the Department of Commerce, and we appreciate the lot. We're not always feeling that much love. My question really is about this economic statecraft is a wonderful initiative, very positive getting the jobs um, that the Foreign Service does is very important. It has created some confusion out there in the roles between Commerce and State Department uh, you know, at the post level. And I'm wondering if you have, you're, you're aware of that and if, you're, uh, if there's a plan to try and clarify some of that confusion, maybe increase the communication level here in Washington or out on the field about that? That's a great question. Um, uh, I'm, first of all, I, I, as you know, um, Gary Locke, who was the Commerce Secretary, is now our ambassador to China. Um, and, and, uh, and I've had lots of conversations with him about this, but I've also had lots of conversations with John Bryson. In fact, uh, I had John come over, the Secretary of Commerce come over to the State Department yesterday, and I pulled the 20 of our largest uh, ambassador, our embassies with our ambassadors, in a room with John to talk about the connection between the Commerce Department and the State Department. Select USA, which is a, which is a program to talk about uh, yeah, inward investment, investment from overseas in the United States, which is, which is a program that the Commerce Department has done uh, quite well and how 
the department, how the State Department can work with Select USA. Obviously, the President's export initiative, which is doubling exports in five years, how the State Department can work with the Commerce Department to, to, to basically help meet those goals. So what I have tried to tell our guys, and listen, and you always have, as we like to call it, a channel conflict, right? I mean, uh, and, you know, I, I've tried to tell these guys, we don't have time for a lot of, you know, uh, uh, arguments about who's on first. Let's be clear. The reality of this is, is that Commerce plays a very important role in these embassies. Now, the problem the Commerce Department is having, the same time we're having, but to a lesser extent, is that they're having their resource constraints. So they're, on the commercial service, they're pulling people from many of these countries. So we're trying to keep them. We are, continuing <laughs> up. I am trying to force, whatever that means, you through Chief Emission Authority, to keep the Commerce, to keep the people in these countries. So in places where we have a strong economic team, we want more, so to show the value of the commercial service people. You know, sometimes they say, oh, forget them, you know, who cares? They, they want them. They want the foreign court. In fact, they want to double down. So, you know, my view of this is, I have a very, very strong work relationship with the Commerce Department. Most of our ambassadors do as well. Uh, we have to be clear of who's on first and who's responsible for things. Our biggest challenge with our econ officers, to be honest with you, they're doing like I, what I like to refer to in the business world as non-core activities. So they're not doing what I'd like them to do, which is econ work. You know, they're the you know control officers when people like me come to the country, which is not really what I've had them doing with their career opportunities. So, so um, I would totally focus on exactly that question because I want to make sure that we're working together collectively. Because you know, one plus one will equal two. It better not equal one and a half, or we've really screwed this thing up. I think we have time for just one more question because of Secretary's schedule. But now I'll take two more. Go ahead. Take two. Good. Well, then you and then we go. Uh, Irving Rosenthal, former Minister Counselor of Foreign Service, now a professor at American University. I don't want to rattle the cage too much. Go ahead. But I will. Um, there has been a uh, battle, conflict, if you will, between the defer development and the defer diplomacy ever since year one, let's say beginning with the, the Marshall Plan. It's going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and it's never really uh, been, been settled. Well, principle one of management is he who controls the budget, controls the program. And therefore, from your point of view, uh, I'd like to find out what you feel about the relationship between D and uh, the two Ds, particularly since you are now head of, of the budget. And there are three things that you talked about that I, that I will raise, you know, so, some examples. Uh, as far as development people are concerned, and I'm a development per person, PEPFAR is an absolute development disaster. Uh, PEPFAR is a screwed up program that uh, destroys development in any country because it's, it's absolutely single sector focused and you never get into broader develop, uh, health development and you never get into broader economic development. And then we talked about um, this economic statecraft. Well, you know, uh, who would you rather have? I mean, in the Marshall Plan, one of the things that it did was develop Europe so that it could grow and trade with the United States and buy and sell. Well, overseas we have AID development officers whose main goal is to develop the local economy, create local jobs, so they can deal with and create jobs in the United States. And you even said that the econ officers are now doing something non-core. That's right. That's not their job. The State Department is a professional organization doing its professional thing, and to the extent it tries to become the development agency, is ruining development and it's ruining diplomacy. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> okay, well, that wasn't argumentative. Um, uh, so let me answer the question. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, I have a unbelievably strong work relationship with USAID. Um, I love Raj. Um, I think he's doing a terrific job to uh, USA Forward, uh, trying to continue to reinvent the development. Uh, Development at aid is hard. It's complicated. Um, you know, doing development as for the for those of you who've done it is, is not easy and certainly well appreciated. Not always well appreciated, but certainly respected. And as I look hand in hand at what they're doing um, uh, as it relates to the development piece in Afghanistan, if you had if Ryan Crocker was here or General Allen was here, they said the the, the key part of the clear hole 
uh, philosophy in Afghanistan is the defense and the development side of the ledger. So I, I, I kind of, I get it and I understand it and I appreciate it. And there is, in my view, a complete link between the development side and the diplomacy side because you cannot, in my view, have one uh, without the other. As a, as a response to your, I, I fundamentally disagree with your, your characterization of PEPFAR. Um, I think, um, again, I just got back from Africa. Uh, I was in the countries in where the PEPFAR dollars principally are the major development dollars that we're spending uh, in these African countries. We are, we are treating uh, 4 million uh, 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 men, women, kids uh, in these countries. We're now upping that to 6 million. If you go to these countries and ask them about how PEPFAR is perceived and how the clinics are perceived, and how we're using the platform of PEPFAR to do other things. That's the whole idea on GHI. The whole idea of Global Health Initiative was to use the platform of PEPFAR to do malaria, which Raj will, is heavily involved in as the initiative over at USCID, uh, and other kind of early childhood uh, diseases as you use that platform that's been created by PEPFAR. So I, you know, we, you know, we can agree to disagree. Um, I will tell you that the um, uh, the public, uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, certainly the people that I deal with at with the USAID, uh, the people that I deal with at PEPFAR have a, a it is in my view one of uh, the most successful programs that we have initiated uh, and the Republican administration initiated and the Democratic administration continued. So I, you know, like anything else, uh, people have uh, complaints and disagreements, uh, but on this particular case, I, have, I am fundamentally a supporter of the PEPFAR program as not only um, a program that helps uh, uh, do something that has ravaged uh, much of Africa, but more importantly is a, a very, very strong uh, development tool as well and will continue to be one. Um, Last question, question here. Um, a lot of us have been out in the past to argue for the State Department budget, and some of us will be out again this spring and early summer making the same points in the heartland. And so I have a, a comment, a question. The comment is it would be very useful if we could look to the website at State or at Ash or someplace as the budget process goes along so that the people who want to advocate for State can be kept current on where things stand, including the good stories that link back to the key priorities that are in the national security budget. And that national security label is critically important when you're trying to make the case outside of Washington. The question is, what was the initial reaction on this? What is state hearing through agents and other offices to the FY13 budget? Is this going to be, are there areas where we need to focus on and we're doing advocacy outside because the initially poor reaction, or have you, have you been able to define where they're coming um, Yeah, it's really too early to be honest. I, mean, I, I think it is. We, we spent so much time trying to remember. We didn't get the 12 budget done until the end of the summer, so we, you know, we're all flailing around trying to make sure we got the 12 process done. Everyone was all locked up in this whole uh, budget deficit cuts that were trying to hold master plan. And so I think we're, we're going to have a real crisis potentially, not just us, but DOD as well, which is, you know, remember the, this whole issue around the sequester at the end of the year. And so if we don't come up with some budget agreement at the end of the year, you know, we're going to have some major draconian cuts that are going to be automatic. So how that all plays out depending on who wins the election. How that all plays out in election year as it relates to the Bush tax cuts and if they are allowed to expire, all those things where we'll come into the mix of how those decisions are made. So my, my assumption is that the, the, the fights that we'll have over the 2013 budget will be really about how much do we spend on the frontline states. Do we really need to spend any more developed dollars in Afghanistan? Iraq's coming down. 2013's budget was 10% less than 12. It's going to come down even more than that. I mean, the number we put in 13 will not will even be less than we originally had because we just we're getting we're not we don't believe we need as big a platform as we had. I believe that the security is is better than it was. So those numbers will be coming down. That said, how do we? Uh, where's going to be the argument? The argument's going to be on frontline states. Uh, that we're going to get a lot of pushback on. One thing we put in the 13 budget was about $750 million for a Middle East initiation fund, basically an incentive fund, which is basically uh, our answer to, you know, you got all this stuff going on in the Middle East. You got Tunisia, you got Libya, you got Egypt, and we have no money. We can't, we did that in Europe. We had a whole fund, as you know, uh, in Europe focused on, on European development. We need this on the Middle East. So we set up a bucket of money. We're going to have to, 
hard time defending that because Congress isn't like just buckets of money. They want allocated numbers. They want it all nice and clean, and that's not what we offered up. We just offered a, a bucket of money, so we have to fight to keep that. So um, the arguments are going to kind of play out. I think we'll probably be in a situation, I think, this calendar year that we'll end up just having a CR. I may be wrong, but the reality of this is you've got an election year, the Congress kind of slows down, you have the conventions, then who knows what's going to happen. But we have all the information you need on our website. We've got a lot of stuff, and if there's anything you need, Susan knows where we are. Um, you know, I've, we've been very clear about getting our messages out. My budget testimony was up. My, my, the press thing that I did during the uh, rollout was up. So I'd love to have you guys as best advocates as I can. So let me uh, just uh, sum up uh, as I started. Uh, it's hard for me to articulate um, uh, how uh, respectful I am for what you've done and what you're doing. Um, Many of you have had choices in your careers and where you want to spend your time. Um, you know, it's not always perfect. Um, it is called a job, I know that. Um, uh, but uh, for, the, for someone who uh, was on the outside looking in and now on the inside looking out, it's pretty cool, as I said at the beginning. And, and it's not only cool from the fact of it's interesting, intellectually interesting, right? Um, but we're having an impact. And the State Department in particular is at the front of all these debates all over the world. Just pick up the newspaper every day. It's not always good news, but if you pick up the newspaper every day and look at what, what's going on, you're at the front and center of everything that's going on in the world. And um, that's you all. So um, thank you all very much. Cool. Thank you. to have you as part of the team as you are to be here. So oh, thank you. So thank you very much. Couldn't All do right. that. Thank you, thank you so All much. Right. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you.